them or for John, please post them in the Q&A box on the bottom right hand side of your Zoom box. It's better if you post them there than if you post them in the chat box. <clears throat> and then in the chat box, you'll find links for purchasing both um, John's new book and Kim's new book, as well as links to upcoming events at Broadway Books. And speaking of upcoming events, next Monday, we are hosting another poetry reading at 4.30. This one will feature Charles Solizicki reading from his hot off the press chapbook, Elegiac, and Brittany Corrigan reading from her new chapbook, Breaking. If you would like to attend this event, just click on the registration link on the event page on our website. Just like tonight's event, it is free but it does require pre-registration. And this Saturday, April 24th is Independent Bookstore Day. Ah! While things will be a little different this year, thanks to COVID, we still plan on celebrating with you all day long. Check out our event page to see what will be happening. We will be offering a very special sale, some exclusive Independent Bookstore Day items, a handful of online book recommendations, along with some poetry and musical interludes. So we hope you will join us for that. But enough of my rambling, let's get started with this evening's event. We are pleased to welcome to the Broadway Books virtual stage two terrific Portland poets and teachers. John Morrison will be sharing from his new collection, Monkey Island. Published by Red Bat Books, John's previous collection, Heaven of the Moment, was a finalist for the Oregon Book Award for Poetry. John earned his MFA from the University of Alabama and has taught poetry at the University of Alabama, WSU, Vancouver, Portland Community College, and the Attic Institute. I hope as part of his talk tonight, John will tell us about this beautiful cover art of his new book. Kim Stafford will be sharing po poems from his new collection, Singer Come From Afar, which is literally hot off the press from Red Hen Press. Kim earned his bachelor's, master's, and PhD in medieval literature from the University of Oregon. Go Ducks! He is a teacher, the founding director of the Northwest Writing Institute at Lewis and Clark College, and the author of a dozen books of poetry and prose. In 2018, Kim was appointed to be Oregon's ninth poet laureate. And when you read Kim's book, I encourage you to not skip the afterword. I know the poems are going to be what grabs you, but read the afterword too. It's pretty awesome. And with that, take it away, Kim and John. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Broadway Books. Thank you, John, for joining me and Ellie in the background, making sure everything works. Uh, I feel so privileged to be here with the fans and supporters of Broadway Books. Uh, at John's request, I'm going to start with a poem called All My Relations from Singer Come From Afar. I want to thank all my relations for this chance to be on earth in her time of flourishing, to thank the first people of this place, the Multnomah people, the Clackamas, Wasco, Kathlamet, Cowlitz, Watalala, Kalapuya, Molala, Tualatin, Chinook, to honor their sovereignty in long and continuing relation, still teaching us how we might be here together. I want to thank my mother and father, moon and sun, for setting me forth before their own passing on, to thank my grandmother who listened to me so eloquently. I learned to listen to my own heart and mind to find stories and songs there, to thank my family and friends and all citizens and travelers who study and work for deeper kinship in this place with one another and with all creatures, one earth, visible, palpable, fragile, intricate, resonant, in need of our better stories. I want to thank you who have gathered to receive what I have carried here in hope that something I have may meet something you need so all our relations may be strengthened for the life we live together. Amen. Well, when this book uh, had been accepted, uh, 
about a year ago and uh, I called Red Hand and I said, hey, I need to add some pandemic poems. Uh, I'm writing them every day, putting them on Instagram. I want some in the book. And so they, uh, you know, slowed the production process. And I want to read one of those uh, pandemic poems from the book. It's called Mingling, Mingling. Remember how we used to do it? Weaving through the crowd, brushing shoulders, fingers, touching a sleeve, adjusting a lapel. First an old friend here, then turn to banter with a stranger, finding odd connections. You're from where? You know her? Going deeper into story, leaning back in wonder, bending close to whisper. Secrets hidden in the hubbub, as if in the middle of this melee you found a room and lit a lamp. Then the roar of the crowd comes back, someone singing out a name, another bowing with a shriek of laughter, slap on the back, bear hug, void of fear. Imagine, just imagine. We have to imagine being in Broadway books, rubbing shoulders. Uh, I so look forward to that day. Well, one of the things that um, happened when I was Poet Laureate, uh, I became a servant uh, of listeners, of readers, of individuals, of groups. And I found myself writing poems not about things, but for things. Not about people, but for people. And uh, so I want to read one I wrote for the uh, 20 inmates I met at Two Rivers Prison up in Umatilla. Uh, and it's Two Rivers because the Umatilla and the Columbia uh, come together there. Uh, but I started thinking about Two Rivers, the visible and the invisible. So this is for the gentleman at Two Rivers Correctional Institution. One river flows above ground. Everyone can see it, shining across the land, following the valley, shaping the valley, never at rest. And some people say, I know who you are. I know what you've done, what you lost, where you came from, where you're going. I know. But what do they know of you, really? For another river flows below all that, invisible, at the speed of a dream inside you, intuitive, curious, innocent. And you say, I know who I want to be. I know what I've learned. I know what I love. I need to know who I really am. So you remember, you wonder, you write, you shape story, and you say to yourself on the page, Hidden river, spill your secrets at the wellspring. I hold forth my cup, no one else can see. Well, um, a friend uh, who spends a lot of time uh, doing drama in prison, uh, directing Shakespeare plays, holding dialogue circles and so on, he told me uh, uh, that he'd had a call from a friend, Rocky, who's on the inside. And uh, when the virus was heating up, uh, Rocky called Johnny and said, Johnny, I'm worried about you. You know, here on the inside, we're used to uh, lockdown. It's a way of life. But uh, for you, it's going to be hard. Are, are you okay? And I was moved by uh, the idea of uh, an inmate being concerned for someone on the outside. So I wrote this poem, Inmate Calls Home. Mom, I've been all night worried. This virus thing, they say it gets everywhere. So don't go out, okay? Get food, sit tight, read, just read. You, you like that. Make calls. Not like visits, I know. You love those friends. Nights I hear you tell them things in my mind. But, Mom, I've been worried. Cabin fever. 
Yeah, here on the inside, we're used to that. Lots of practice. Time crawls like a broken dancer. You watch it. But mom, what you gonna do with all that time? No visits, no go where you want, no bench in the park you like. Nights, mom, no worry. No, you worry, okay? Me, I'm good. I'm so good. Um, well, this idea of writing a poem for someone, uh, Sally mentioned that John and I are both teachers, and so I want to give you some <laughs> optional homework. Uh, and that is, think of someone in your life who needs a poem. And then either uh, find a poem or write a poem for that person and uh, pass it along. Uh, I, I have a friend who was having a tough time. She'd lost her husband of many years. And um, so I decided to write a poem for her. And this is called Song After Ishiguro. It has an epigram from Kazuo Ishiguro. There was another life I might have had, but I am having this one. There is another life I might have had, but I am having this one. To glimpse the roads I never walked, my heart begins to spin. I carry wayward stories of all that might have been. If I were starting over, would I take this life again? Can I savor satisfaction for all I hold within? Win or lose is not the game. With every breath, begin. Those were the lives I might have lived, but this is the one I'm in. Okay. Um, I want to uh, show a little film. I uh, hope the technology will work. And first I'll read you the poem and then show you the film where the poem is accompanied by images and some uh, music by uh, On the Harp by my friend Bethany. The poem's called Lessons from a Tree. Seed split, root sprout, leaf bud. Delve deep, hold fast, reach far. Sway, lean, bow, loom. Climb high, stand tall, last long. Grow, thicken, billow, shade, sow seed. Rise by pluck, child of luck, lightning struck survivor. Burn, bleed, heal, remember, testify, nest, host, guard, honor. Then fall. Settle, slump, surrender, offer, enrich, be duff, enough. So here's the, here's the film version of that. Lessons from a tree. Seed split, root sprout, bud leaf. Delve deep, hold fast, reach far. Sway, bow, lean, loom. Climb high, stand tall, last long. Seed, thicken, billow, shade, grain. Ring, grow, sow seed. Whine, sing, flicker, glimmer, rise by pluck, child of luck, lightning struck, survivor. 
hollow, glisten, witness, seed again. Remember, testify, thicken, burn, bleed, heal, seed, learn. Nest, host, guard, honor, savor, seed again. Fade, groan, sag, crack, split. Soften, slough, grip, gather, then arc, swish, sail, fall, settle. Log, stump, slump, sag, surrender, offer, enrich, be duff, enough. Okay, um, one more poem, and then we'll hear from John. And after that, some conversation. Uh, so this last poem in this set, and John and I are each going to read one poem at the very end. Um, but the last poem in my part here is called Nest Filled. Uh, and it was uh, shortly after the election of 2016. I found myself um, watching the birds respond to all the troubles in their lives and came up with this poem, Nest Filled. Use your whirling wings to find the right tree. Use your pert eye to choose the level limb. Use your nimble feet to cherish the hospitable fork. Use your fearless beak to gather twigs, leaves, grass, and thistle down to weave the basket house open to the weathering sky. Use your body to be the tent over tender pebbles, lopsided moons, then wait, a warm, alert, still, through wind and rain, hawk shadow, owl night. Use your life to make life, spending all you have on what comes after. And if you are human, a true citizen, fully awake, learn from the sparrow how to build a house, a village, a nation. Use your instinct to find the right place. Use your thought to know the right time. Use your wisdom to design the right action. In the era of stormy weather, build your sturdy nest and fill it with the future. On to you, John. Um, especially the poets out there will know what I'm thinking right now. It's who follows Kim Stafford? Um, <laughs> thank you, Kim. Um, it is a, it's an honor to read with Kim. Um, what he does for poetry, for art, for our state, for our country and beyond. It's great to be here. And thank you to Broadway Books for being our bookstore with such verve and toughing it out and keeping my wife, Kim, in plenty of books. Um, so thank you, Sally, Kim, and Ellie, and all the folks down there. And I want to thank, well, I want to, I want to be a good guest and give Sally what she wants. Monkey Island, I didn't know what it looked like from Monkey Island. 
until my friend Miro Merrill found her way there and painted this cover for me. Um, I want to thank um, the folks that read that book, Kristen and Greg, and the faith they showed in my work. Um, I also want to thank Peter Sears, who uh, the book is dedicated to, for all he gave me for our, our time together. So um, I'm going to read a couple. I'll start with a new poem. I'll read a few from Monkey Island and then um, a, a poem from my previous book, Heaven of the Moment. And then I guess, can we take some questions or make up some nonsense, whatever it is we're going to do. But here, I'll get started. I figured to get to Monkey Island, I should probably get us there. This is a new poem, my next project. The raft was just large enough for my eight cats, me, a piano, and the rough hut I fashioned from scrap wood and empty bleach jugs. So we all smelled scrubbed and slightly combustible, even as I built a floating island with dirt and ivy to be visible only to the faithful. I added a palm tree on the desert side, a chicle tree on the jungle side, and hung the moon and sun opposite. The anchor slipped in boredom and we gained a trailing rope, a thin but lengthy tail to mark where we'd been on our drift down one river, lazy as summer, into the confluence of the next and on. The cats missed the rats back and missed the rats in the hedge back home, but the morning and evening fish rise was a suitable distraction. I deputized Sir Tittles to rule wisely should I become drunk on date hooch. We lost to a determined osprey pixie who loved to walk across the keys in his rendition of heart and soul. To me, the island remained fixed below the sun and moon and night stars. So the people who dallied on the bank would see him in motion and wave, and I would wonder, where are they going? I would see children in a tree at dusk and want them to be home before dark. Our island flourished, even in rain, a measure of sun. We befriended river pirates until even they couldn't reach us on the current of our creation further out in the river ocean. Next stop, Monkey Island. So uh, Monkey Island is really began as a series of poems. Um, but became one poem. There's section breaks. I'll give a little bit of pause between them. I think there's seven sections. And no, I don't know where these came from. Cleaning up junk left over from making the universe. The first monkey dropped a meteor, seared all the surrounding trees. Now the monkeys press their hand and footprints into the still steaming metal to mark their moment in the creamy gleam. Monkeys always argue their favorite color. Midday, the sky just above the boulder, the translucent ear of a newborn, what dolphins breathe inside an oyster shell, the cave mouth, lava at night, fresh coconut meat, palm of the great mother after she rubs her chin, her chin. For the winter solstice, the monkeys trail long strands of tinsel for one more night. They ache the next day and sleep on the beach. The children bury them in, their, in the sand up to their faces and the faces become a long path of stepping stones. To escape the thieves who come one night, 
all the monkeys climb down and hide inside coconuts for 61 years. When a storm rolled a giant spotlight up onto the beach, wedged in the V of two palm trees, half the monkeys wanted to gut the metal for decorations and turn the large drum into a toy. They kept the spotlight whole for their plays. Always a scuffle and monkeys bite to be on the stage crew. Spotlight the villain. Spotlight the couple kissing in the wings. Spotlight the magic stone in the hand. Stay with the stone. In the red wind, even old monkeys are scared when flying fish pelt the island. The typhoon left behind, golden glass floats in the lagoon, a cave open where there was no cave, and a deflated silk balloon draped the trees like the cast off negligee of a giantess. One sunset, every monkey took a turn inside the pillar of flame and every monkey ached to share the light with loved monkeys no longer alive. Each thought, I want to hug the missing monkey who already gave their body to the river. We're gonna read um, two poems that have I guess we say they're linked. I didn't know it at the time. My, uh, my father was a pilot in the Air Force and for a year when I was six, um, the fifth of six children, I was six, my younger sister was five. My father was stationed in the Philippines flying uh, supplies for the Vietnam War. For a full year, our dad lived away on an island and flew planes, heavy with missiles and gold, and on weekends would golf with gorillas. At home, our mother was lost in the pantry or the laundry, the attic or behind the water heater, where she'd open the electrical panel and with trouble light and butter knife, tinkered with the base circuitry of our home. Summer, my older brothers found a shaded bank along Wild Horse Creek where they and their 16 year old friends could drink beer and slug each other. My oldest sister neglected her hair and washed the dishes. My next sister read historical novels in a room for nine straight days, slept for three, and went back to the court of Charlemagne. My little sister sucked a pebble and kept asking, where's dad? I'd say, sis, the plane, the missiles, the gold, the golf, the gorillas, remember? Then the lights would flicker out and from deep in the house, we'd hear mother curse, damn. They'd flicker back on and the big fan in the living room, a monster my size by the name of Arctic Breeze with a blade like my father's propeller would wind up to a deep resonant whir and spit a subtle rose water from a reservoir our mother filled each morning with a potion of crushed red and yellow velvet petals. I was the family dog sniffing the trail by the creek, sniffing the steps to the basement, the threshold of my sister's room, the clean plates in the dish drainer, the family dog. Unless I was a boy answering my sister, gold, golf, remember, missiles, gorillas, or lying on the living room floor, damp in fragrance, or wrenching the rabbit ears right on the TV, to scare away the ghost stalking Daniel Boone and his Cherokee blood brother, the Faye yet lethal Mingo, a TV I would now and then hug. 
uh, it it the idea that uh, I would hear on the on the radio news or TV news that Vietnam part of Viet the Vietnam War was guerrilla warfare, and I was uh, terrified as I look back that my father was in a war with guerrillas, and I don't think anybody can win a war with guerrillas. Uh, and then in a in a odd twist, my father returns from from the Philippines and to horseplay with us, uh, adopts a persona of Bigamunkum, who is of course a gorilla. Um, and now you know where this poem came from. My father, the gorilla. My own father didn't know what to do with me. His hairy arms held me close to hairy chest and I looked up into his soft, troubled eyes. The church and Darwin told him, you can't have a human child, but he cared more for me than dogma. He chased my cousins and me around the yard with a rolling knuckle running gait, whooping and tipping over baby hippos and stuttering, you bad monkeys, you bad monkeys, you bad. We used pith helmets as bowls for coconut milk and explore knives to scratch our butts and cut ourselves free from the webs of giant spiders. And for our whole time together, we loved the trees and the breeze at night. We'd climb into high hammocks we braided from python skins, sway and hum until we fell asleep. Then at 20, I needed more than bananas and grubs, crouching in the rain with only a leaf for a hat and always being wary of poachers and missionaries. I met my mate on the path by the blue giraffes. She brought me a pair of trousers and led me away to have our own children who grow more human with every tomato. No word in gorilla says forever. So my father and I slapped each other goodbye. Here we are. We'd been together all night on the ferry. God in black, acts the ass, embarrasses himself, brags he can end us, all sapiens in an instant, all sparrows too. He wouldn't dare dish this shit if the Holy Spirit were here to twist his ear. So Mike, in a glorious act of bravado, reaches over, gives God enough of a shove. He trips, topples over the rail and tumbles right into the sound. The splash kicks up as the ferry powers past. We know we're in for it. We also know no real harm done to someone named Almighty. He'll be furious. We'll take our lumps. Hope he's outgrown his Old Testament temper. Off the ferry, Mike and I park downtown, sit in the back of the pickup, then wait for God. When out of a side alley, he runs through traffic right at us. In an embrace, in an embrace of the inevitable, while simply clowning, we wave, yell, hey, God, over here. He soaked, pissed, never has a moment been so precious. We climb down out of the truck, hug him, say sorry, ask if he's okay. Though he's mad enough to teach us a profound lesson in the chain of being, he's charmed by our high spirits and hijinks. And we are contrite. Pushing anyone off a moving ferry is wrong, regardless of how omniscient he might be. We bow, eyes closed, so he can talk to us inside our heads. Then I pull the ratty army blanket from behind the seat, help God from his sopping shirt, pants, lace boxers, socks like sea slime, down to the flesh, none of us can see and say the same way. 
I see mirror, what the dark moon sees, myself in negative. I see a passage and down the passage, a child on the other side of the world, her bright face the size of a quarter. I look to his sad, waterlogged feet, wrinkled old as though pickled. Then we wrap him snug and I'll sit in the back of the pickup in the warm peach of a morning sun, smoke cigarettes, drink coffee, sing slow and deep, swing low, sweet chariot. So I would like to end this round with a, like I said, a, a poem from my previous book. And this is really sort of for my, for my, uh, all my aunts and uncles who have, who have given their body to the river. How's that? Promise of more. Um, just by way of introduction, there's not a lot of smelt running now, but it used to be you could go out to the rivers, dip them up, take them home. My folks would fit a bunch in a, um, a, a milk carton, cardboard milk carton, and then just freeze them. And uh, my brother Tim and I are visiting my folks one, one summer or something, and they want to get all these smelled out of the freezer. So they just kept feeding my brother, Tim, and I. Um, promise of more. Forever, I thought the freezer would store a nice block or more of smelt, silvery and silver eyed and solid in half gallon milk cartons. My parents and aunts and uncles went smelting wading into the sandy or Clackamas River to dip the long nets into a flashing school. A hundred is a good day. And I say without regret, when the season came where the brothers and sisters let pass the radio news that smelt were running and stayed home, old aluminum nets hung in the garage, I never knew I'd miss the fish. Not for the salty bite, not for the crunch of the spine or cornmeal crust, but because they were on our table an impossible plenitude. And I'd been served my own oily steaming plate stacked with smelt with a promise of more if I wanted and more after that. And the house was a smoky light as it rained the steady rain of a forest, a rain falling softly on all our rivers. Thank you. That's beautiful, John. Really beautiful. Uh, I'm glad I don't have to follow you. <laughs> you know, uh, I write poems. You make worlds. <laughs> that first sequence it just kept unfolding. And I imagine uh, parts of it could be written in the middle of the night, in the light of morning, uh, on a sudden whim. And uh, that world just keeps growing. And then your your poems about your your siblings, uh, you know, I've read memoirs that couldn't do that much in two hundred pages. I just loved all the all the rich moments and difficulties and uh, mysteries you you got in there. Thank you. Well, it was two hundred pages that poem, and then I cut it down. <laughs> um, but the other thing I want to say, John, I I really hear uh, the spirit of our friend Peter Sears in your work, and I know you learned a lot from each other, and it's just wonderful to hear that humor and earnestness and depth and light touch all at once. Well, um, you know, Peter was fond of saying it is the the imagination. The imagination is what fascinated him. Yeah. And that's like, I know your teaching does this, Kim, in that we all have access to that. Yeah. That, the, the, that among the tragedies of our time is that somehow we forget that we have that power. Yeah. And, we, and we watch, that's when we're teaching children and they, they have no trouble with it. Yeah. And that's why we love, you know, sort of the tribe of, of poets is that imagination, no problem. Yeah, yeah. But Peter, Peter loved the inventive, 
Peter loved, um, you know, when, when people sort of touched in poems, that's, yeah. that's what he loved. Yeah. So, thank you. You're, you're reminding me, John, uh, a sound I haven't heard for a while from my days of working with very young kids in poetry. Uh, do you know this sound? Who wants to tell about their dream? Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> the hands, you know. And and then uh, junior high, silence, you know, there's a wall. And you think, did school do this? Uh, did we all do this? Uh, did capitalism do this? You know, the going into hiding as a human soul. Uh, and and, and my, my take on that is, um, we know when 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 Sally Sally sure knows this. My time with uh, literary arts, working in the writers in the schools program, yeah, yeah. and and who we think are the most difficult students to reach because they just they just don't want to share. Yeah. But their whole but once they do, yeah. you, you have them. Yes. You know, once they write down a sentence, you have them. Yeah. Because they they you know they're all there. They just. Yeah. You know, the thing is, they think no one cares. Yeah. They think people, I mean, how many people are afraid of teenagers? Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm remembering uh, <laughs> a class uh, had, I had uh, <laughs> 200 kids in the cafeteria for a poetry <laughs> class. And this little guy in the front row said, uh, I ain't writing. You know, he folded his <laughs> arms and said, okay, it's free country, you know. <laughs> And uh, so pretty soon most of them are writing and uh, he, he beckons me over and he says, uh, how do you spell scarred? Ooh. I said, I think it's got two R's. Said, okay. You know, so then when it's time to share, ooh, 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 I was scarred for life by a policeman's bullet, you know, and he's off. You're oh, right. Wow. Once the spigot opens, uh, you just hope that the first person who shares will do something deep and true. Okay. And then everyone's, everyone wants to get on board. Well, that, um, that work you and I know Paul Ann and, and uh, friend Dave Jarecki and I got to accompany Peter a couple trips around yeah. the state. You know, the, 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 the hunger and the appreciation out there yeah. um, and the joy really, yeah. so. So you, you deserve a thank you for that. <laughs> well, um, you know, I, when I think of Peter, I think of um, something Sir Philip Sidney said in the 16th century. Uh, think like a philosopher, but speak like an ordinary person. <laughs> and he went on to say, most pedants think like an ordinary person and speak like a philosopher. And I've always thought Peter was someone who wore his great, uh, his great wisdom lightly. Uh, you know, humor, he delivered uh, depth with humor, something I aspire to. Yeah, I do too. That yeah. sort of generosity yeah, yeah. to give. <laughs> well, I wonder if we have any questions. Uh, John and I each have a poem to end up with, but uh, You've seen any me questions? Pop up. We, yes. We've got a couple of questions, if you guys don't mind um, answering them. Um, both right, the two I've got right now are both from the dear Melissa Medensky. Uh, John, I so like your mother, and like Kim, I felt your family come alive. Um, and she also loves the nod to Peter Sears. Have you written any more poems about your family? Such rich moments in your work. Yeah, John, is that family getting into your writing life still? I, I, I don't know. I'd have to go look at my notebook. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I'm uh, to be to be honest. I've been doing a little more of that uh, world stuff. I'm 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 kind of okay. This sounds this sounds particularly pompous. But I'm playing with the idea of, uh, you know, sort of a my own mythology. I think we all have our own mythologies, and I'm like, why not? Uh, uh, why not write about the Amazon people and stuff like that? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't, I don't direct my pen really very well. It, 
that's why I said I really would have to go look at what I wrote in my my journal. So I can I can get back to you on that. <laughs> well, what is that saying? You're, you're born into a family and they spend the rest of your life looking for your family out in the world. And maybe the, the myth making is uh, is an extension, a sort of extrapolation um, as if those siblings of yours were holes in the wall of existence that enabled you to look radially outward into uh, the vast mystery. There's, there's something about how family leads you to other people and other places and other worlds. Yeah. And that, that is, that is true. And that's yeah. like, your family just expands like that. Yeah. Yeah. I just have to tell a story here. I was, I went to the hardware store the other day and uh, this guy came up to me. This is what, this isn't how life used to be. This is how life should be. <laughs> This guy came up to me, he had this beat up uh, tweed cap and a sort of a tattered uh, logger shirt. And he just launched in, you know, I was wearing my hat and he said, hey, I like your hat, I'm Irish, my name's George. And you know, fella dropped a tree on me November 20th. I was at OHSU for three weeks. They thought I was gonna be brain dead. They took a cut into my leg. Here, let me show you. He pulled up his pants. See, they slid it from the knee to the ankle. They peeled all the meat off the bones and they kind of put it together. And uh, anyway, I just uh, wanted to say I like your hat. <laughs> and I just thought, oh man, um, I want to be, this is this is my, my goal. You know, the, the gypsies, when they uh, knocked on a door for a handout, if they got a handout, they'd leave a mark in chalk you know, that the, at the gate. I want to have that kind of mark on my face <laughs> that people will just spill the, you know, what's on their mind. And I think maybe poetry and certainly books uh, open people up to their own stories and the stories of others. Once you have a book, you're not so lonely. And, and the we know this to be true how so many folks think they don't like poetry. It's like, <laughs> you don't, well, <laughs> I, I always have a couple answers to that, but I always say poetry like uh, heaven. My father's house has many rooms, right? You don't like that room? Go to another, it's a big party. Yeah. Yeah. Just look around. Yeah. Um, and they do like poetry, yeah. and they do, so. Yeah, well, one of my riffs when I was going around as poet laureate is, you know, poetry, is our native language. Oh, nice. We don't speak in undifferentiated prose from margin to margin. We speak in <laughs> pauses, negative space, units of breath. Uh, and uh, I would quote Wordsworth, uh, the greatest poetry is uttered by ordinary people at times of great emotion. So it's, it's everywhere out there. And uh, thanks to our publishers, it's in books. And thanks to our booksellers, it's in bookstores. Well, <laughs> well done, it. Kim. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. Sure. For that. I've got one more. I have another question from Melissa too, and this one's for you, Kim. And actually, I think it kind of ponies onto what you've been just talking about. Um, she's heard you talk on, about the brevity of Instagram, and I have to say, I'm one of your followers, and I do <laughs> religiously every day. Um, what has that brevity given you as a storyteller? Um, well, it's back to this idea, Melissa and Kim, uh, of writing a poem for someone. You know, uh, I used to scoff at Instagram, all that technological stuff. I love fountain pens. I love paper. I love a direct connection. Uh, but when I realized a thought that's important to me, I can tailor it as a gift and in a moment I can send it out. It makes the poem short. <laughs> if the poem gets long, the print gets really small. <laughs> uh, and so the poems are short. They're uh, from ordinary sources of daily life and uh, they just go forth into the world. Um, you know, but then I, I hear from people, uh, I got a, I got an email out of the blue saying, hey, I'm in a hotel, I read your poem and I copied it out for my grandmother. <laughs> you know, well, 
that's almost as good as having a book in Broadway books, you know, to get that kind of response. Thanks for the question, Melissa. So if you if you don't mind answering one, just a follow up question on that, Terry Fullen's wondering, do you choose the poem or the picture first? Uh, I, I usually choose the poem. I usually write the poem and then go looking through the thousands. <laughs> Uh, but sometimes there's a photo where I think I've got to write a poem for that. Um, John, let me let me get your unvarnished opinion. What do you think about the Facebook, Instagram, and poetry? Is it a match made in heaven, or is it the devil's work? Um. Yes. <laughs> no, I don't. I, I'm. I deleted my uh, Facebook account yesterday because somehow I haven't been on it for years. I'm afraid yeah. of Facebook. Yeah. Um, I deleted it because I, somehow my account or something was going on. It was generating friend requests. And I'm hearing from all these good friends that are going like, why are you asking me to be your friend? So I, <laughs> I, I went ahead and I deleted it. Yeah. And I'm not on Instagram because I don't believe in pictures. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I do play with Twitter, which is pretty fun. And I follow, right. follow some writers on Twitter. Okay, well, John, let's have a beer and compare notes. You can teach me about Twitter, about which I know nothing. I okay, should we day. each read a poem? Read us a poem, John. And okay, I'll read you. I'll read another new poem. Um, I said it's this come. This is called "Goats from Sheep." which is a reference to, you know, the, the end of the world where we will separate the goats from sheep. The day of reckoning, you and I will say hello for the first time. Everyone edgy, I will peel and offer half an orange. Though goats are a little unsettling, the way they stare with amber eyes, for luck, I like to rub the bony nub between the horns, and you know why. How determined they are. How with a tap, tap of gentle correction, they can browse the day a fearful bramble, even in heaven. How enlightening, sturdy, they just breathe to, the best, to bestow calm upon companion horse. There will be a lot of barking, from all the frightened doggies. A lot of erratic moths loose in the air, but with lovely ferny antenna and opalescent wings. Fuchsia is absolutely your color. We can lock eyes to, to stay steady, reach, tangle fingers, and then hold hands up to the end, maybe after. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Broadway Books. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, thank Melissa. Thank you, John. Well, I'll follow that with um, a poem that is addressed to myself. Uh, it's called The Fact of Forgiveness. And uh, maybe this goes with last things, John. Um, I was walking along early before dawn one time, and through my mind went this sentence, uh, I have to forgive myself. And I thought, well, for what? And the sentence that went through my mind, for being Kim. You know, there's something unforgivable about who I am. And so I wrote this poem to console myself. So it says you, but it's addressed to me. The fact of forgiveness. It is a given you have failed. It goes without saying you were hurt, and so you hurt some others. Of course, you alone could have saved someone or something you did not. The midnight court of the sleepless mind has reached its verdict, life sentence. Life will be long and hard, but also mysterious in how you are condemned to live by beauty all the same. Through the bars of your cell, you must watch the moon grow full and generous. A tune made for others will arrive at evening, smuggled into your mind, as if for you. 
The world can't keep its treasures from you. No matter how little you deserve, you have it all. Moon, sun, sleep, waking, water, air, a bird dancing away out of sight, leaving the print of its flight and a filament of song for you. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you, Broadway Books. Thanks, all. Thank you, Thank readers. You. Be well. Trying to unmute myself. A huge, huge thank you to both of you and to everyone for joining us tonight. You can get copies of both of these beautiful books, Broadway books, and um, next time in the store. Next time in the store. So to to poetry Monday night. Thank you guys so much. Take care. Bye. Thank you all. <laughs>